Howdy everyone and welcome back. And today it's gonna to be a, a bit of a different video so I don't have as much time as I'd like this week. And so this is gonna be really be a long, pretty much uncut unless something awful happens around here uh, video of going all over the basics of magnetic fields and a ton of things to do with them. So, you know, apologies in advance if it's gonna be rather long and or if random noises or random things happen, but that's what we gotta live with this week. So we're gonna talk about magnetic fields. So we've been talking about electric fields and electric fields are relatively simple. You have charges existing, they affect each other. Magnetic fields are a bit more complicated because um, you need a few things. Um, you need something to create the magnetic field, which you know we talked about magnets, so maybe that seems basic, but magnetic fields themselves don't really act how we would think they would act compared to like how we've learned electric fields. For instance, if I have something living in a magnet field, if I just have a charge living again, I really need a charge. If that charge is just sitting in that magnetic field, nothing really happens. It actually has to be moving in the magnetic field. It has to have some type of non-zero velocity. The other weird thing about magnetic fields is that they don't exert forces in the same direction as the field that's actually always perpendicular. And so something that comes from that is that you actually can't, well, magnetic fields themselves can't actually directly do work. They can't directly give energy, although you can store energy in magnetic fields. We may get to that at some point. But they, there's a lot of weird directionality that we're gonna have to work through and work around to really get how they're working. So let's go over that again. So we have here a few things about magnetic field. So they're actually created by moving charges and then they only affect moving charges. So this is, again, maybe a bit different than what we think about naturally about fields working and maybe I don't, maybe we haven't talked about magnetic fields but at least certainly when I started learning that that was a bit different than my experience but so you can create magnetic fields from moving charges so say I have a wire um, of charge uh, this wire contains moving charges and those moving charges create magnetic fields and we'll go over in the directionality in a bit but if you're interested in and we're going to need this in a few later problems if you're interested in the magnetic field created by a wire it's mu naught i over 2 pi r and maybe we recognize this 2 pi r i talked a little bit before about the electric field created by a line charge or infinite line charge it also had a 2 over pi r uh, con contribution uh fault it's not over one over r square but one over r so this purely has to do with geometry just like it had to do with electric fields and so there's also a different force law with regards to electric well sorry different force law with regards to magnetic fields compared to electric fields so call well, electric fields it looks like f equals e q and these are vectors and there's a there's a directionality that we'll get in a moment so just looking at the magnitude Instead of it just being the magnetic field times a charge, a velocity is involved and an angle. So this angle is between the velocity and the magnetic field. So say I have some magnetic field that's pointing to the right. I have some charge that's moving down. So this force, this magnetic force, is not going to be moving in either of these directions. It's not going to be moving in the same direction as the magnetic field. It's not going to be moving in the same direction as the velocity. It's actually going to be moving in a direction that's perpendicular to both. And so there's two directions that are per perpendicular to both. And this is the weirdness of magnetic fields. We have to think in really a 3D sense. It's either going out of the page or into the page. And we have to figure out which one of those two. We need to use something called the right hand rule. And we'll learn that in a bit. But as far as the strength, regard, uh, we need to add this sine of theta. So when is this a maximum? Well, sine of theta is a maximum when this angle is gonna be 90 degrees. So if there's a 90 degrees between the velocity and the magnetic field here, this will be one and the, and the magnetic field, the magnetic force will be at a maximum. In fact, if the velocity and the magnetic field were pointing in the same direction, sine of zero would be zero. So there would be no force. So you they actually have to, the velocity and the magnetic field have to be moving in at least slightly different directions for there even to be a force at all. So we can calculate the magnetic force on a single charge. We can also calculate it on a wire. So you can imagine we have charge meters per second. So we smooth sort of the per second over here and we can get charge per second times a length. So we can actually find if we put a wire of charge, well, it's a wire, you know, it has a current going through, not really of charge, uh, sitting in a magnetic field, we can actually find the force on it. So we'll do some problems with charges. We'll do some problems with wires and um, we'll go from there. So 
some of the directionality things that we need to keep in mind are that there's two right hand rules and we'll often be using the second one with regards to the force on a charge but the first one actually has to do with what direction does, um, uh, if I have a charge moving in a certain direction, what direction or how does the magnetic field look that gets created from it. And so how this looks is you, you know the direction of the charge the, or the direction of the current, really the same thing. You point your thumb in that direction, so say it's going right at the camera, and then the magnetic field created by it is going to be going the same direction if you wrap your hand around. So again, these are called the right hand rules. You need to use your right hand. I've seen people taking tests and doing this. Uh, you know, you know how you look around a little bit in test is look at the time. And I saw someone, you know, writing with his right hand and then using his left hand, looking at it and you know messing with it to get. The, you no, know, you have to use your right hand. So right hand, point it, your thumb in the direction of the current or the charge, and again wrap your hand around. That's the direction the magnetic field will be created. So if you wire, it's actually wrapping around in a circle. Um, in this cross-section. Again, you have to keep a little bit of the three-dimensional stuff in your head. So that's the first right-hand rule if you want to find magnetic field created by a charge or a wire. To get the direction of the magnetic force, we need to use this second rule. So that's this one. So this is taught sometimes a few different ways. There's one way that makes a lot of sense to me, uh, how I usually um, think about it. It's that you point your hand in the direction of the velocity. So again, we have either a charge sorry, not charge, again, current, maybe the current or a velocity. So we have charges moving in some direction. We have a magnetic field. And so I point my hand in the direction of the direction that charge is moving. Say it's moving right at the camera. I point my hand in that direction. Say the magnetic field is pointing this way. Then I wrap my hand around in the direction of the magnetic field. And then my, if I point my thumb straight up, that's the direction of the magnetic field. So if I have velocity this direction, magnetic field this direction, magnetic force will be pointing up, be pointing straight up. And so you can do that in any direction that you want, velocity, magnetic field, magnetic force. So again, because of that, we'll note that the magnetic force is always perpendicular to both. And because we're using right hand, we're able to distinguish between going into the page or out of the page. But again, it really depends on the very specific um, directions that you're given in a problem. And we'll go over those and we'll do a few examples. But this is something definitely want to at least we'll really practice this one a lot. We really want to practice getting this directionality. It will come up a lot, especially the second one. Maybe this one comes up a couple times, but yeah, make sure we can get this one before we get any sort of other test. So let's do a problem. So we have a proton being created from the sun. So protons get ejected from the sun, a little bit of electrons and some alpha particles and alpha particles are really just the nucleus of a helium atom. They all get ejected from the sun and they're moving pretty quick. This one's moving four times 10 to the five meters per second. And we also note that the earth creates a magnetic field and it sort of looks like this. It starts from the North Pole, points out and wraps around into the South Pole. And this is going on created everywhere. There's a non-zero you know, magnetic field you know, you're experiencing. It's not really big, so it usually doesn't matter too much in everyday life. Um, again, three times 10 to negative eight Tesla. Uh, one Tesla is a lot. I mean, so 10 to negative eight, it's not a whole lot. So we'll, we'll do something over time. But the first thing we want to figure out is what is the force on a proton moving with this velocity coming in? Um, well, so we can go and put in all this information. We can go and use our force law with regards to magnetic fields. We use the one on an individual charge just because we have an individual charge coming through and that's QVB sine theta. So what do we put in here? So charge of a proton, okay, 1.9 times 10 to the negative 19 um, coulombs. They give us the velocity here. We are given also the magnetic field created by the earth. And how do we get this angle here? So again, recall that the magnetic field created by the Earth looks like this. And so when the proton actually gets into the magnetic field, it's actually, magnetic fields can be pointing down at any places actually, you know, coming in towards. So magnetic fields pointing down, velocity is pointing this direction. It's gonna be 90 degrees between them. So again, well in here we put 90 degrees and we can get this number here at one point. Uh, 1.92 times 10 to the negative 21 newtons. 
not a very big number, but again, over a very long distance actually can make a pretty big difference. So maybe we want to get the direction as well. So we're going to have to use the right hand rule here. So we have a velocity pointing in this direction. So I, I drew out a little coordinate system here just to keep track of everything. So I have velocity pointing in the positive x direction. We have the magnetic field pointing in the negative z direction. So what direction will the magnetic force be? Well, again, let's use the right hand rule. Let's point our hand in the direction of the z direction. Sorry, the point our hand in the direction of the x. And then curl it into the negative z. And they'll find it has to be pointing in. Is that right? Yeah, I think I, I, I think I had a slight error. Okay, I think it's going to be the y direction. Yep, that, that's got to be the y direction. So I had a slight error. Okay, so we point our hand in direction of the x direction. We curl it, turns to the negative z. It's going to be pointing in the positive y direction. The force is going to be pointing this direction. Okay. So what happens if we had an electron instead? Well, the only thing that gets reversed here is when we when we is this charge. So when we do the right hand rule, the assumption is that it's a positive charge. It's just like when we're working with electric fields, we get a negative charge, just switch the direction in the end. That's the only thing that, you know, it really changes. Uh, so we, you know, do the right hand rule, find the direction a positive charge would go in. For a negative charge, it would go the opposite direction. So uh, again, I have an error here. This should be the negative y direction. I should probably check that beforehand. But going to be going the opposite direction as before. That's the only little difference. So there are electrons that get emitted by the sun. Okay, that's fine. Okay, here we have pretty, this is one of my favorite problems regards to magnetic fields. It really starts to combine electric and magnetic fields together. But we have a particle coming in with some type of velocity. Now it's sitting in both an electric field and a magnetic field. And so to note, sometimes we write magnetic fields that are again three-dimensional uh, using X's and O's. So X means it's going into the page. So X is going into the page. And sometimes it's either circles or circles with dots and that's going out of the page. So it's coming out towards you. So that's what that means. So these are going to be magnetic field lines going into the page. We'll keep track of that. So we want to find the velocity if it's sitting in a certain electric and magnetic field. It turns out nothing else really matters. Not the mass, not the well, really, anything else, um, uh, the other, any other properties of it, uh, or even the charge, but this will tell us tell us something about the electric and magnetic field. So, this thing, so we, it, the set also part of the setup is that we have a particle moving, but it's moving purely horizontally. So that means that whatever forces or whatever is going on with it, they're all being canceled out, and it's not accelerating in the y direction. It's just constantly moving in the x direction. We'll find that happens, but. So we want to find the velocity if the acceleration is equal to zero. So it's saying I have some type of force exerted by this electric field, some exerted by the magnetic field, and we'll find the directions in a bit. Um, but they're canceling out. So we'll see where that's going. It's going to likely be that they're going in the opposite directions. But So we have forces. So what do we do with forces? We do Newton's second law. That's what we should always think about. The sum of the forces equals the mass times the acceleration. In this case, acceleration is equal to zero. So what are our forces? So we have an electric field and we have a magnetic field. So how do I get these directions? So if it's a positive charge, the electric force will be pointing in the same direction as the electric field. That's what this equation tells us, F equals EQ. Um, uh, that, that's a, where that's a Q. So if this is positive, then these are both in the same direction. Okay, how do we get the magnetic field? So velocity is pointing to the right, curl our hand in towards the page, and we'll find the magnetic force has to be pointing up. So it's going the opposite direction as the electric field. And notice we set that up intentionally so that would happen. I mean, we could flip the direction of the magnetic field and be pointing in the same direction, then it would come careening into the side. That's not what we did. We set it up so that they cancel out. Okay, so we, we can write out Newton's law. The two forces are electric field and magnetic field. And you know, I pick some direction being positive and the other being negative, N not a huge deal. I know that these are gonna cancel out, but those two forces added together have to be zero. 
So we can write out the electric force as QE. We can write out the magnetic force as QVB sine theta and sine, well, what's the angle? Sine of 90 degrees. The, the magnetic field's going into the page. The velocity is going to the right. That's gonna be a right angle between them. So this is just gonna to go to one. Sine of 90 degrees is one. So we have QVB, okay, so they both have Qs on each side, so that we just get E minus VB equals zero. So we can solve for the velocity. It's just the strength of the electric field over the magnetic field. That's So essentially what we can do is that we can select for certain velocities. I send a bunch of particles through here, all with different velocities, and I make this really long so that if it had the wrong velocity, it would start slowly curing off and hitting to the side. So I can select for a very small you know, width of velocity. Anything with a little bit more or a little less will go and crash the side. So I've now selected for the velocity. It has to be roughly this and with some error depending on the height of this. Okay, what else can we do that? What else can we learn about this particle? Um, well, we can go and after its velocity has been selected, just put it in an area where it just has magnetic field. So out here, no more electric field, just a magnetic field that's still constant. So because there's no electric field, there's only a magnetic force and that's gonna push it upwards. And because, this, because it's pushing it upwards, it's gonna slightly change the direction. And once the velocity changes the direction, it's gonna actually change the direction of the magnetic field. And you can see how it goes along. It's always gonna perpend be perpendicular. It's always gonna have a force pointing inward. So it's actually gonna create a circle. So this is the same force, uh, well, so this is the same effect. If you have a sling and wrapping it around, that tension and that rope is always pointing perpendicularly to the velocity of that thing moving around. Um, so it will create, make it so it's moving in a circle. It's the same thing that we've hopefully seen uh, in a previous class, but, but just motivating why it actually moves into a circle is because it's always perpendicular. The force is perpendicular to the velocity. Okay, we want to find that the radius, we want to find the radius that this thing moves in this circle um, and relate it to some of the other quantities that we have, like potentially mass, velocity, or the magnetic field. So what is that, what's gonna happen? So we write down, again, we only, we're working with some, you know, working with forces, so we have to write down Newton's second law, that's the only thing we know to do with forces. So the only force left is the magnetic field, so there will be an acceleration. We know it's moving in a circle, uh, recall that the acceleration of something moving in a circle is V squared over R. So the magnetic force, QVB sine theta, okay. Um, but we have Vs on each side, so one of them cancels out. Again, we have this 90 degrees thing. We, uh, it's always perpendicular. So what are we left with? We're left with QB um, MV over R. So we can go and solve for R, multiply the other side, divide the QB out to the other side, so you get this expression, m over q, v over b. And we know that we've selected for the velocity before, so v has to be e over b. So we know exactly how to relate this radius that we've measured to some of the other quantities. We potentially know how we've set this up, so we know what the electric field and magnetic fields are. We have know that. But now we've gotten a precise measurement of the charge mass ratio. So this is something that's easily you know, calculable. I take a ruler. Um, and I, in my experiment, my experiment, I say, oh, you know, what's the arc of this? I mean, that's that's not too hard, you know, to calculate this distance here. So you can get this, but then you've now measured the charge mass ratio, and so this is somewhat how we figured out the charge mass mass ratio for electrons. First, it's hard to break those two. There's a lot of experiments that help get that ratio, but it's hard to break the degeneracy between these two. But this is how a lot of early experiments and physics, when we're learning about these particles, again, we didn't have electron microscopes then, how can we actually learn about these particles when we don't really know what they were, we didn't really know what electrons are? Well, we do experiments like this with electric and magnetic fields, and we're able to relate that to the microscopic quantities. Okay, I, I, I like that problem, I, I think it's pretty good. But there, there's some other good stuff in here too we're gonna keep learning about. So here, um, we're gonna learn how magnetic fields can be resistive, um, we, we technically can, we can store energy in magnetic fields. We have to use wires and doing a, a few things that are a little bit more complicated. Um, but here's an instance where magnetic fields are going to cause, um, you know, some type of resistance of something falling. And, you know, that's one particular application of magnetic fields. There's a lot of interesting ones that we'll get to in a bit. So I have this circuit here. It has some overall mass, so it's either either connected 
um, to some weight or itself has some uh, weight, so it says mass m. And it's partially in a in a magnetic. It's partially in a magnetic field. That's the words. Uh, so it's not all of it. It's just this part up here. And so it's going to be falling. And I want to figure out what. To, well, I want to have to figure out a number of things. I want to figure out what kind of current needs to be going through it to make it so that it actually is just being held there. So you can imagine you make a little contraption like this. You can actually use magnetic fields to hold things up. This would be an instance, say, I want to hold up my keys or something, connect it to a little circuit and a constant uh, magnetic field, and poof, go put it on put it on your wall uh, using just an electromagnet or something like that. So. What is the current that needs to be going through? I have a resistance R, I have some battery with, you know, epsilon voltage, and this thing has a length L. And it turns out its dimensions in this way won't really matter too much. It turns out that will end up canceling out a bit. But what is the current that we need? Oh, actually, let's explain that a little bit. Well, well, well first, so we're going to need the force uh, of a man magnetic field on a wire. That's going to be ILB sine, uh, it would be ILB sine theta. And imagine when we, you know, all three bits of these are going to have uh, forces exerted on them by the magnetic field. So all three of these bits. But it turns out these two are going to cancel each other out. Um, it turns out they'll, I, I can't remember if they're inward or outward in this problem, but, but because they have the same exact length, they have the same current, the same magnetic field, um, and s similar but opposite directions of the, the, the current that all of this is going to cancel out. This one has you know, very different direction because it's end up being per perpendicular. So we can sort of just neglect those two parts. But, you know, we want to figure out what's going on when all these forces cancel. So how do what we do? Okay, forces cancel. Forces, Newton's second law. Forces, we should always think Newton's second law. That's always what we, we should write down. And we want to have it a situation where it's not moving. It's stationary. Acceleration is equal to zero. MA equals zero. Okay, what are the two forces? Well, it has two mass. Well, it has two forces, it has one mass, um, and do that mass, it's going to have a downward magnetic uh, force. And, sorry, because it has mass, it's going to have a downward gravitational force, and therefore I need to create a magnetic force pointing up to counteract that. So it has an acceleration equal to zero. So I don't recall if they told us the direction of the current, but I they told us the direction of the magnetic field. Say they didn't tell us the direction of the current, we could actually figure it out. So we have um, we have either the current can go left, oh sorry, this is the direction of right. Uh, it can either go left or right. The magnetic field's going to the board. So let's say I knew the right answer. So the magnetic field's, so the current's going, to, I keep saying the wrong word for everything. The, the, the current's going to the right. Um, uh, the, the magnetic field's going inward. So we point in the direction of the current. We curl our hand in the direction of the magnetic field. Uh, magnetic force would have to be going up. So we actually did get the right direction here. We did write it down correct. Okay, anyway, so magnetic force is definitely pointing up. That's what's going on. Uh, you write down the magnetic field, ILB sine theta, and then we write down the the gravitational force. I keep saying the wrong word. I just keep saying the wrong word for everything. Okay, the magnetic force on a wire is ILB sine theta. Per, uh, this is perpendicular. The current, again, and the magnetic field are perpendicular. This is not always going to be true, just in the problems we've been doing. So just, you know, really keep that in and ask yourself that question every every problem that you do, um, whether that's true. So, but again, uh, perpendicular, so this is equal to 1. Um, told the length, I know the magnetic field. I mean, we have these numbers written up here. And we're told the mass. So, we, you know, right here, we can just start solving for the current. We move. Uh, add, M, uh, add mg to the other side, divide by lb, we find that the current has to be nearly 10 amps. And 10 amps is a lot. I don't know, I don't, I don't think we talked too much about um, currents, but remember 30 amps was enough to start frying wires uh, in your house, and that's when the circuit breaker trips. So 10 amps is a lot, um, you know, to really damage someone and stop their heart. I mean, you can do that with less than one amp. So this is a lot um, to make that work. So uh, we can keep going. This say we need the voltage through this battery so maybe it's powered by the wall i mean 115 volts is pretty close to the wall of 120 so what kind of resistor do you need well that's just v equals ir well, now we know the current use v equals ir solve for the r uh, we get something like 12 ohm, a little bit less than 12 ohms so that's not that high that's a pretty pretty small um, so this is something you could build at home it, it, you have to you have to create a pretty big wire so 
um, have a pretty small resistance. So you could you could do this. Um, you, so you could sort of you could sort of see how you can uh, feasibly do that with a device at your home, although it's not quite the most efficient use of energy all the time. And we'll figure out other good uses of magnetic fields in a bit. I think likely next video um, with, with magnetic induction and charging your phone, that's really using magnetic fields, but I think we'll get there in a bit. So, but here's a problem where you can test and learn about how to use, uh, we'll find the magnetic force on a wire uh, with some current. Okay, let's keep going though. So here's a slightly different problem. We have a loop sitting in a magnetic field, and this is not going to be one that's uh, going perfectly perpendicular. So we'll have to do a little bit of work. So one thing that we might be interested in um, is finding the torque, and to do that, we need to find the magnetic moment on a uh, on a wire. Magnetic moment's really just something that measures how much it will get affected and torqued by a magnetic field. So it's going to be something that looks like the current so more current is going to be more easily affected and turned that's when we will recall back to 120 when we talk about torque we mean um, turning something it's the it's the angular uh, equivalent of exerting a force so a car with a lot of torque is going to be able to rev up and accelerate quicker um, we can it, again you just translate that to the angular equivalent so or having so bigger current um, has been more susceptible to being torqued. Bigger area, so more area for the magnetic field to pass through. Okay, that makes sense. And the number of turns. So again, you just effectively increase the area by making the wire go around many more times. So, um, and that, we can see what, where that magnetic moment's gonna come in a bit, but we have something, um, uh, we have a mu here. So we're told, you know, they can easily get this magnetic moment as, as far as we know all these terms. They told us, okay, we know the radius, we know the current, and we know the number of turns. This is something we can just go straight up and write. So the cross-sectional area is going to be pi r squared because we have a circle, uh, circular wire. Put that in, and we get this number for magnetic moment. Again, this is really going to be a means to end to find the torque. So actually, let's talk about moment for why the, the magnetic field is going to torque this bit of wire. So it's moving in, it's a current moving in a circle, and then you have a magnetic field passing through it. So let's just talk about what's happening on each end of the wires and you can sort of extrapolate from there. So let's talk about what's going on here and what's going on here. Let's just pick two points. So here I have, I hope I picked the right points, but I have a current that's pointing, let's say, into the camera. And then I have a magnetic field that's been pointing this direction. So I use my right hand. I point my hand in the direction of the magnetic field uh, sorry, point my, hand, point my hand in the direction. I keep saying the absolute wrong thing every time. Point my hand in the direction of the current, current direction of the magnetic field. So, no, I'm doing this wrong. Okay, there we go. The, the current, uh, curl it in the direction of the magnetic field, which is at a weird angle. So the force is actually going to be, it's going to be up at a diagonal like this. So let me use a different color. I guess you use green. So it's going up and points like this in terms of the picture. So on this side, magnetic force looks like this. Here, okay, current going into, uh, into me based on the picture, the magnetic field, <laughs> we're gonna lose it really quick, magnetic field uh, pointing here. Uh, so current here, it's gonna be, um, this is when it starts, really, so let me do the other one again. Okay, so this one's going in towards me. So the magnetic force is gonna be pointing this direction. Okay, there we go. So you can see it's being sort of turned. We see these forces and they have components that if this was on a swivel, so, oh, that's not the best one. But if this, this was on a swivel right here, that you would, it would actually turn it because both of the ends are being pulled like this. Um, so we, you will actually exert a total torque if it's allowed to turn. That's what, that's what we're talking about this bit. So to calculate the torque on a you know, bit of wires, you know, we have a circular one. We found it's the magnetic moment, the magnetic field, and this angle. So this angle is going to be that the, the magnetic moment is going to be pointing. Uh, it's going to be pointing perpendicular from the direction of the current created by this sort of thing. And again, we can figure it out using some sort of a right hand rule. But uh, so if I have this thing going, this is going counterclockwise, it's going to be pointing perpendicularly up from that. 
uh, again, there's a lot of weird directionality things to figure out with with, uh, with magnetic fields. But again, we can always kind of go back and and figure out what direction is being torqued from the basics if we really wanted to. But so we have a magnetic moment, magnetic field, and this angle. So we're given some information about this angle. We're told it's 60 degrees, and we're told the magnitude of the magnetic field. Okay, what's the torque? Well, put all the numbers. We did all the work to find the magnetic moment. We're told the magnetic field. We get this angle. Okay, it's some amount. So why is this important? Why do we care about this at all? Well, magnetic fields can turn things. Sure, so we, we can't normally think about it storing energy in terms of just putting a book on a bookshelf or I just put it on a bookshelf, I take it down, I get that energy back. That's pretty much how electric fields work. I take a positive charge, put it near another positive charge. Okay, once to push it away. So I actually stored it energy and then I can release it. So magnetic field's a little weird. Um, instead, I can store energy by turning something and putting it in a direct, in a, a port point when it actually wants to get torqued back. So. Uh, it could be a loop like here, like where I put it in a moment where it really wants to get torqued backwards. I'm storing energy there so I, cause, because I'm having something in an uncomfortable position and then it wants to go and turn back and wants to actually create kinetic energy. So I've actually stored energy in the magnetic field there. So, so that's one way to store it. Or we can think about what's more common um, in terms of dipoles. Uh, well, these are magnetic by dipoles or maybe they are electric dipoles. Uh, I, think, I think they're actually electric dipoles. I, I think I'm confusing myself, but imagine you have something, uh, the key point is I have something that has some directionality um, in terms of charges and, and currents. And yes, this is a, a magnetic dipole. Yeah, a little thing uh, of, <laughs> of a wire that you can think about uh, that the most ideal bit of wire with current going around is this magnetic dipole. Essentially, it's, it's something like this. Let's go back to this example. It's something like this. It has a directionality that it wants to point uh, in terms of a magnetic field, and I put it so that it's uncomfortable and it will want to flip back. So that's actually how an MRI works. MRI, um, well, probably learn a little bit more with magnetic fields, but it creates a huge magnetic field. You have all these little dipoles uh, in your body. Well, you have these atoms um, that have electrons going around, so it's creating a current going around. And I create a huge magnetic field and I flip them all in the same direction. I flip all the little magnetic fields, all the little uh, electrons in your body, flip them all in the same direction with this huge magnetic field created by the MRI. And then you turn it off. And so they all, they all start flipping back. And so that's actually what happens. That's how you're able to see things with the MRI that creates a little bit of light when they all sort of flip back. And things of different materials flip back differently. So bone flips back differently than muscles. So when you have um, these dipoles flip back, create a bit of light, I catch that on the outside, and from that able to reconstruct what's actually going on inside the body. So this is relevant for MRIs, and a lot of things we're gonna learn a little bit, well, especially more relevant now um, towards a medical, have had a lot of medical use. So that's maybe one reason we should care about this. Okay, let's keep going. I think we have at least, yeah, I think we have two problems, and then we will call it for today. It's gonna be a long, I know, a long video, but We'll keep going. So next thing we can care about um, is going to be the force of two wires on each other. So recall that um, that moving charges create magnetic fields. They create it and it looks like mu naught i over two pi r. So essentially, I have two wires next to each other, and we have wires running around. So it turns out they actually exert forces on each other. Wires exert forces on each other. Now, usually they're, we're going to learn they're pretty small. I mean, they're usually negligible uh, and don't really matter. Um, and, and usually it's shielded enough sometimes even make it so it effectively doesn't. But you know, imagine we have unshielded uh, wires and, and, and big currents and they actually can't affect each other. Okay, you know, we'll go from there. So I have a current going to the right on this top one and I'm told the direction that they'll be exerting forces. So I actually wanna figure out what the direction and how large the current of the second one is. So I told the forces, I told them they're pushing each other away. So these are wires that are repelling each other. You can also make it so wires are attracting. It has to do with the directions of both of these currents. Are they the same? Are they in the opposite directions? So we wanna go and figure out, okay, what's the direction and what's the magnitude? Well, we can find the magnitude 
um, of, of the current because they told us the magnitude of the force. So again, the force of a, uh, on a wire from a magnetic field is ILB sine theta. It turns out um, we'll find that again, this, these things will be perpendicular, so we won't care so much about this. Uh, we'll, we'll think about the magnetic fields in a, in a moment, but for now we'll note that this is going to be perpendicular. But recall, again, magnetic field created from a single wire, single wire is mu naught I2 over 2 pi r. So we're finding the force exerted on this first wire from the second wire. So this one is creating a magnetic field going around it, and this magnetic field Again, this wire is living in this magnetic field. This magnetic field is going to be affecting the, ch the charges and the current moving through this one. It's going to be exerting a force. Okay. Again, we know that the force that this one is creating as the uh, as it's moving around. Yeah, it might not get the directions right, but just you know making a point here. So we're able to write that. We're able to write that down. We put in that B. So I'm. So we put in that B. We're able to write out this expression. I don't recall why I divided out L to the other side, but at this point we know what I1 is and we can just solve for I2. So if you go solve for I2, throw all the stuff to the other side, uh, that's essentially what we do in this step, including I1. These are all numbers that we know. We're told the force that the wires are exerting on each other. We're told the current of this one mu naught is just a, um, a, a constant in nature, the permeability constant. Uh, mu naught can also be written I want to make sure I get this right, but it's, is it one over, I think it's four pi times 10 to negative seven in some, you know, some units that you can look up uh, in terms of SI stuff, but it's a pretty common number. It's something you can look up just like um, epsilon naught. It's a, it's a fundamental constant regarding the strength of magnetic fields regard to the things creating them. They have been very analogous when we learned in Coulomb's law. So these are all numbers we know. Um, we're also told the distance between them, so it's four centimeters. We put that in. We find that this current had to be eight amps to get this strength. Um, at this point, we haven't really cared too much about directionality because it turns out the current's pointing either direction. This is going to be sine of 90 degrees. Okay. So let's think about the direction. So um, we have to think about this for a bit. So so let's go back to our picture. Again, we're gonna get a bit confused because in reality, both of these currents are creating magnetic fields. We really only really should only think about one of them at a time. Just let's look at the the magnetic field created by one at a time. It's the it's the magnetic field created by this one affecting that. Sure, this one is creating one that's affecting that. Okay, but you know, let's focus on one at a time. So we have we have this wire here. We have this wire, I2, that's creating a magnetic field. We can just start drawing this out. What does this magnetic field look like? Well, um, we want it to make it so that it's a force pointing up. So let's take a guess. I'm gonna make the right guess, but we'll argue for it in the end. Uh, I'm gonna actually use current as this direction. We'll say the current was moving in the opposite direction and see if we get the right answer. What is the magnetic field look around this thing. Well, we learned at the beginning, we have the, the first right hand rule. If I point my, if I have a direction of current or a charge if it's moving in a certain direction, I point my thumb in, direct, in that direction and the magnetic field looks like how it's curling around my hand. So one way we can draw the magnetic field. So again, it's, it's a three dimensional thing. It's all curling around. So it's going around like this. So it's, you can imagine one way to draw it is it's curling around like this. If we're gonna draw it in a lot more of a three-dimensional um, aspect. Or we can draw it when it's actually, that three-dimensional thing is crossing this uh, y um, x plane. So I only care about it when it's, you know, the plane where that the current, the other currents, you know, directly above it. So it's, you notice that's gonna be moving into the page here and out of the page here. So again, even though it's really a three-dimensional thing, it's a really three-dimensional thing that's existing, um, going around a wire passing through this plane, essentially, that I have to draw everything in. Um, let's keep in mind that it's three-dimensional, but we only have to really care about it when it's passing through that plane. So here, everywhere below, it's gonna be coming out of the page. You can, you can see in this whole plane below, it's gonna be coming out of the page when it passes this XY plane, but up here, this plane is going to be going into the page, and I guess that again has to do with the fact that it's circular and wrapping around. So we've learned how to write that in. So in here, it's, 
how we write it's going out of the page are these dots so um, you know I'm just gonna write them as dots in this case you can do circles and dots it really depends on the person but so it's I'm denoting that here it's coming out of the page and all up here it's going into the page so here this is how we get the directionality now we know the direction of, of man the magnetic field so the current I1 is pointing in a direction uh, it's pointing to the right the magnetic field is going into the page so the force had to be up so I guessed it right so if I got it wrong let's say the current is going to the right but magnetic field is going out of the page you can see that the force instead would be down here so you know this is actually going to be controlling whether they're attractive or repelling so in this case if they're opposite directions we'll find that they're repelling um, and then we can go and do the whole thing in reverse so down here we have the whole thing in reverse um, although I, I think I switched the direction of, of the current so again this one is creating this this one is creating magnetic field up here it's going in a direction but all below it's going the opposite direction and uh, if it's moving in, in to the left wrap our hands around <laughs> I think I got it uh, no I got it let me think about it Thing. I, I got it. Yeah, this picture is wrong. Uh, yeah, let's ignore this picture. My, what I drew up here was drew up here was correct. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what I was doing here. But point um, is that they're going opposite directions. They're going to be repellent. But if they're going in the same direction, um, the force would actually be attractive. So again, if you if you reverse this thing, you made the current so that it was going this direction. I said this would these would all be x's. These would all be dots. So when the current's going this direction. Um, you have the magnetic field going out of the page when it's a dot. The dot means it's going out of the page. Force would be down. These, this would be repellent. And if you did this in complete reverse, um, instead looked at the magnetic field created by this wire, um, then you'll find that it's also going to be attractive pulling it up. You know, I, I don't feel like I need to do it. If you're interested, you know, feel free to, to do that on your own. But here we go. So um, if they're the same, uh, if the same direction would be attractive. Okay. Let's, I, I don't want to accuse myself or anyone else more, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on here. Okay, so here we have our last question of the day. We have something called a solenoid. A solenoid is, we'll also learn about it in a different contexts, called an inductor. Um, it is a looping of, of a, a wire it's in a, into a big coil, and essentially it's like the equivalent of in a lot of ways of our parallel plate. So it's how you make a constant magnetic field. And so how you do that is essentially you have all of these loops and they're all adding up onto each other. They're, remember, uh, maybe, well, we didn't, I don't think we had spent the time, but if you have a loop um, of, of, of wire, if you do the right hand rule, so say I, I have a, a circle here, well, I have a circle here, so let, let's look at this. So say I have current go wrapping uh, around, it's going in a loop here. I point my, let's just point, focus on this part on top. I put my thumb in that direction. My the magnetic field looks like it's wrapping around. So it's actually been going around again, this 3D structure, it's been going in to the loop. So you imagine I have just a bunch of these loops and they're all creating a magnetic field that's pointing in the same direction. Uh, it's, it's looping, uh, they're all looping in the same direction. They're all going to be creating magnetic fields pointing the same direction, and that magnetic field turns out look, it goes and does this reverse thing. It's a lot stronger in here. So again, it's very useful we, to, to make uh, constant magnetic fields, roughly constant as, as much as we can. Again, we can't real, really make a constant electric field um, just in a very local zone with a parallel plate. This is the equivalent of that for magnetic fields. And we've been doing a lot of problems with constant magnetic fields, so you can see why you know, creating one of these things would be pretty helpful. Okay, but. I know a bit about the I know a bit about the the number of turns. I know a bit about the length and the magnetic field and the current I want to create. So I'm going to figure out the number of coils necessary. So this is another this is just an equation we have to sort of pull out of nowhere, but you know something we may need to know. But the magnetic field created from a solenoid in this roughly constant area, we'll see that this is actually a constant that has nothing to do with R or anything. It's going to be uh, mu naught permeability of free space, something we can look up. And this is going to be the turns per length. This turns in the coil per length. So the more dense we have our turns, the stronger this is going to be times the current. Okay, 
So bigger current, bigger magnetic field. Hopefully it makes sense. And so here we have the density of turns. It's really the number of turns per some length. So if I've, you know, uh, I, you know with a, we have some length here, we want to find eventually the number of total you know, turns or coils in it. So we can go and substitute that in. The really thing we want, the thing we really want to find here is this n thing. Okay. So we can solve for it. What's what's the number of turns I need to create nine Teslas? And nine Teslas is a huge amount of of magnetic fields. That is that is quite a lot. Uh, I think I got to remember the top line, the LHC. So the big particle collider that exists in Europe that they you know they help measure things about the Higgs boson and discover it with those giant, they have giant uh, electromagnets. They are the, you know, 10 something stories high. They are, they are massive. I think they're only, I want to say in the hundreds of Teslas or thousands of Teslas that are not in like the trillions of Teslas. They're way smaller than that. So these are, you know, these are, this is a strong freaking thing right here. So what would you need to do that? Well, 48,000 turns. That's a lot. That's per meter. That's, that's a lot of turns, so you need quite a coil. Um, and we know that when we have such large, uh, we have such large currents that we are gonna have to start really worrying about destroying our wires. Again, uh, circuit breakers start tripping at 30 amps. Um, I know I did an experiment in undergrad where I had a, we had a big electromagnet. We were just trying to get down, uh, well, up to two Teslas, and we had to create this, you know, really janky circuit where we had a, a to get up to really high uh, current, we had a really weak resistor over here, um, and <laughs> I think uh, and and it had to be you know essentially we had to sit here and learn how to cool it down because of how hot it was getting because of how high the current had to be to make um, you know our solenoid get up that high. So what do we let's step back and think of a little bit what what did we learn? So we learned a lot about the basics of magnetic fields. We learned about the direction. So we had two right hand rules. Um, we know how to calculate the direction of ma the magnetic field created by from charges moving, so either currents or charges. And what about the force on charges or well, currents? So we had, we had two of these. And we did a number of problems. We did a problem where we found the charge on a, you know, sorry, we found the force, the magnetic force on a single charge. We had a problem where we found the magnetic, the, we combined electric and magnetic fields on a single charge and just did. Uh, a few things pulled in Newton's second law from before, pulled in some things about rotational things, but uh, again, magnetic force is just another force, just like when we added electric force, it's just another force. We learned about some other properties of magnetic fields, how they can be resistive to motion, um, and how to calculate the force on a wire. We learned a little bit about how magnetic fields can create torques and turn things, um, about their magnetic moments, and about their torques. We learned how uh, wires can create forces on each other, and another note probably to make about this problem is that uh, again th this, these forces are pretty small. So this is 10 to the negative four newtons per meter. I mean, a newton's pretty small. That's that's one kilogram. Um, well, I gotta think about that. That uh, 10 newtons is one kilogram, you know, sitting on a de uh, on a desk. So this is this is that you know 10 negative four newtons per meter. So per meter of wire. So usually. You know, wires don't, it's not a big force or something we really have to care about too much, but it, does, it is something that exists and maybe have to care about. And we learn about how to create magnetic fields from a solenoid, which is useful again because of what we often want a constant, electric, a constant magnetic field, just like we wanted a constant electric field for you know, various experiments or whatever. Again, another thing to know about a uh, solenoid, this is essentially an MRI. This is how an MRI works. You have you, that's why the, the machine looks like the way it is. It's just this big, giant coil wrapping around. So what's special about an MRI that it's something that we couldn't do before. So one thing about MRI is you actually can, you, do, you use these huge currents. So this is what's revolutionary about them is that they huge, use huge, huge magnetic fields. Again, nine Teslas. Um, the only way that's really possible. Oh, hey buddy, <laughs> I'm, I'm teaching. Hey buddy, you're fine. Uh, the only, the, the really interesting thing about uh, MRIs is because they to, to do that flipping of of these magnetic dipoles um, is they had to have to make these huge magnetic fields. They made to make these you you know then use huge currents. And the only way that's really possible is to get the resistance 
resistance of the wires really, really low. I mean, we've learned a little bit about that vehicle's IR. So if you get the resistance low, use a moderate voltage, um, you can get huge currents, huge currents with loops means huge magnetic fields. And so the way they're able to do that is, is something called superconductivity. So superconductivity is a special property of materials, and especially there's a lot of them when they get to really low temperature, the resistance of the wires doesn't go, it gets low. We probably learned a little bit about, you know, wires with lower resistance or lower temperatures have lower resistance, but the resistance in the wires when they get that low of temperature doesn't go close to zero, it goes to actual zero. There's actually no resistance in the wires. So you have essentially no, you have, well, you do have no resistance, but then you have some connectors that might have, maybe add a little bit of resistance. So you have extremely, extremely small resistance and these machines create huge currents. And the only way, so we have a number of properties that actually, can, you know, well, super conductivity, by the way, is huge in terms of condensed matter in a few areas of, of physics, because what they really want to be able to do is find superconductors that work at room temperature. All of them that we know now, some of them worked at three Kelvin, so three above absolute zero, a lot of them do, but we were able to find a few of them that work uh, at liquid nitrogen level. So that's MRIs typically, they're using something like liquid nitrogen to cool down the whole system. That's why they're a bit expensive to run, but they're actually, you know, liquid nitrogen isn't the most expensive thing in the world. Um, relatively so um, because of advances in that we're able to do MRIs create these huge magnetic fields you know apply it to imaging inside in a way that we couldn't before but you know it's all stemming it's some amount from this basic knowledge of magnetic fields I mean this is stuff that we've been known for 150 or so years uh, and uh, we found a lot of even just modern applications and we're going I think I think it might be next time for the one after that we're going to be learning about um, charging cell phones, which is something that just happened with magnetic induction. I mean, we were this stuff is still very relevant to a lot of modern technology in terms of 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 of, of utilizing this basic physics. So you know, I think that's probably enough. It's it seems I'm looking at the timer. It's been a really long video. I probably won't be able to do much in terms of editing. So thank you for joining. Um, long rant, long video, lots of problems. Uh, this will effectively count for, if you're following along with the, I'm, I'm teaching a class, so by the way, if that wasn't so apparent with all the previous uh, episodes, that this will count for two homeworks because we have so much, the, the number of problems in it. So, you know, hopefully I'll tie this over for, for a while. But thank you for joining me as always. Um, it's always been great. I feel like it was, it was a talk a lot of this time, but um, thanks for joining. See you next time. Bye.